Hey guys, Aslan Running Guy here. Welcome back to the channel. I have another guest on the show today. Extremely excited to introduce this runner to you. One of Australia's greatest ever runners. He ran from the 1500 all the way up to the road marathon, including cross country world championships. Versatility is incredible. To be running at such a high level through all those distances over such a long career is absolutely a remarkable story. So sit back and enjoy and welcome Sean Crichton. All right, Sean, thanks so much for coming on today, mate. Pleasure, great to be here. Fantastic. Um, what I'm going to do just to bring the, um, the viewers up to date is just read through some of your uh, career PBs. Sure. All right, yeah, so starting from the 1500 all the way up to, to the marathon. So the 1500, 338.59 in Lucerne in June 93. Uh, the one mile in sub four there, 359.46 in Cork in Ireland in June 95. Uh, the 2000 metre, 503 in Sydney in January 92. 3,000 metres, 741.60 in Oslo in July 95. 5,000 metre, 13.17, 76, July 95. Had to look that one up to see if you were faster than Prefontaine, and you were. Oh, right, yeah, there you pre, go. pre went 13.21, so you got in, mate. There you go. Um, 10,000 metre, uh, which I'll, I'll come back to and talk about further. Uh, 27.31. Uh, 92 and Zadpak there in 96. Uh, 2000 metre single chase 53007 in Canberra in December 92. Uh, the 3000 metre single chase 81622, which you're still the, uh, the current Australian record holder of in Lille in France there in July 93. Half marathon 10334 in Sydney in May 1998. And marathon 21022 in Berlin in uh, September 97. So that's an amazing set of numbers there. Thank you. Um, um, there's obviously a lot of runners who have probably tried to replicate that over the years as far as being so strong and, and so consistent from that 1500 all the way up to the, to the road marathon. Um, what do you think um, was sort of like the secret behind your body holding up for so long and over those sort of distances at such a high level? Yeah. Okay, I think in terms of having a, a long career over a range of events uh, and, and how the body holds together, I think that's a, it's a mix of good luck and good management and of course you do create your own luck to a large extent. But my, my good luck was that uh, my hips, knees and ankles pretty well line straight up when I run. So that means there's not the same sort of torque and friction that you might have for, for athletes who might be bow-legged, for example. Uh, but the good management, it, it comes from doing a sensible training program and, and gradual adaptation. Uh, I'm a big fan of not doing super sessions, which are, which are high reward but high risk. Uh, so just consistent training over a number of years and just gradually getting a little bit better every year and I think that's reflected in my uh, progression over PBs in a, in a range of events. Uh, and last but not least is looking after yourselves in, yourself in terms of getting regular treatment. So um, I would get physio, physiotherapy and, um, and massage and sometimes chiropractic treatment um, very, very regularly and now that I'm back running a fair bit, I, I still follow that same pattern of getting a couple of treatments each week. Okay, excellent. And it was only a six, six year window where you were ranging those distances from the 1500 up to the road marathon. Um, did you have to change the amount of mileage or so, what sort of training you're actually doing? Or is that, I mean, it was quite a fast progression from, from the 15 in, in such a short time. Yeah, the. My training changed between running, say, steeplechase and running marathon, uh, but I was always a high mileage, even when I was running my best 1500 metres in steeplechase, I was doing it off high mileage. What changed was that uh, when going from, say, steeplechase training, where I might get on the track and do fast three or 500 metre repeats, you don't do that when, with marathon training. Uh, and just like with steeplechase training, I wouldn't go out and do a, a 10 mile tempo run. So the, the, the core structure of my weekly training remained the same my whole career, but the, uh, and that was basically Monday, Friday easy, Wednesday, Sunday long, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday hard sessions. So what changed over time was how long I went on Wednesday and Sunday and what type of session I did Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and that, that, that often changed throughout the year depending on, depending on the type of uh, more mileage in, the, in a build up and, uh, and, and more speed work during a, during a, a racing season. Okay, excellent. Um, if we can just sort of go back to when you started running um, and, and why you started running. Sure. First started running when I was about nine years old up in um, northern New South Wales in Glen Innes. 
uh, went round to my mate's place for one Friday afternoon to kick the footy around and he was off to little athletics so I just tagged along. Uh, and from then I just basically uh, didn't stop. Now, um, I was, when I say I didn't stop, I didn't ever take it, it was take it seriously until I was about 19. So I had 10 years where I was doing a fair bit of training, um, but relative to um, non-runners, but not, not smashing myself in training. So right throughout teenage years, I would have probably run two or three times a week. Uh, didn't ramp it up to running every day until I would have been 18 or 19. So uh, it was a long progression. I think those 10, 10 or so years, of formative years, where running a lot but not training seriously probably was just a good foundation. Okay. And, uh, I mean, those times for us mere mortals are just quite amazing. <laughs> like, I can only assume there must be something in the family that enables you to run with that sort of ability. Um, is, is there running in the, in the family history? I have my mum and dad both both ran but not not competitively um, my dad ran about 35 minutes for 10k and my mum ran about 38 minutes so uh, but they they both uh, used to go for a run a couple of times a week and I guess that that sort of as role models uh, it was it was just natural for me to go for a run and I'd sometimes run with my dad sometimes with my mum when I was you know um, 10 11 12 13 14 uh, and then um, uh, and just got in that that routine of, um, of, of I guess, active lifestyle. Okay, and when did you realise that you, you had a future in running like? Uh, it's a good question. I think probably the first time I've realised that I could be better than I thought I may otherwise um, have, have realised was I made the World Student Games, uh, World Student Cross Country Team in 1998, uh, sorry, 1988, missed a decade there, uh, having my, um, I'd never made a national team before. I was always I'd make the, uh, I didn't make the state team uh, until I was final year at school. Uh, I'd moved to Ballarat to, to train with Steve Monaghetti and a, a few other people in, in 87. And I still remember Mona saying to me, when I left to go to the World Student Cross Country in 88, I said to Mona, any tips before I go over? Because Mona was the defending World Student Cross Country champion. He said, yep. He said, uh, you'll go away on this, this team. And there was six men in the team. And I was the last one picked. They picked the team in, in order, and I was number six out of six. He said, so one person in this team is going to really learn a lot from this trip and come back really fired up and, and kick on. He said, just make sure that person's you. And it was terrific advice, and I've given the same advice to, to some other youngsters uh, over the years, and, and that person was me. And I went, went to the World Student Cross team in uh, championships in 88, uh, expecting to come top 50, and I came 15th. So that was probably the next day going for a run realising when it sunk in, I was like, well, maybe I can make a, world, uh, a senior world cross country team. Um, and, and still at that stage, I didn't think I'd make Commonwealth Games or Olympic teams, but um, I guess once you get to that next level of, of making national teams, the Commonwealth Olympics are the next step. Okay, yep, fantastic. Um, if we can go back to, to the mid nineties when, when you were probably racing at your career best and yep. all those PBs I originally mentioned um, were all in, in the mid 90s. Um, I'm just thinking with your with your race strategy and your mindset, um, do you sort of most of the time go into those, uh, those races with a set plan or does every now and then you just sort of feel fantastic and you just go with the flow if someone attacks you tend to go with them or is it like I need to sit on this certain time per lap? Sure. Good question, and, and the answer is I would go into every race with a with a clear plan. Uh, and the plan might be in some instances to, to win the race, other times it would be to go after a certain time, uh, sometimes a mix of the two. Uh, so I would almost always follow a pretty clear plan, and, and, and I like to think one of the strengths I had as a competitive athlete was being able to set realistic goals going into a race, and I was normally pretty well spot on with the form I was in and, and, and how I was able to run that. Uh, would I sometimes just throw the race plan out the window and, 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 and just go for it because I was feeling good? Yes, the answer, that, that happened several times uh, and I normally crashed and burned. So I remember 3,000 metres in Cologne in, in 93, I just run the Australian uh, steeplechase record, I'd run the fastest ever 1,500 metres, I was in, I was in terrific form. Um, and, um, and Kip Cosguy, who, uh, 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 Kip Danui, sorry, who was the world record holder at the time of the 3,000 metres, and Bob Kennedy, who was um, one of the top, top guys in the world, they went for it and I decided that I was feeling good enough to, to have a go as well. So 
at the bit the Australian record at the time for 3000 was 745 I got to the bell in about 738 so I was looking good for running 738 739 it took me about six, uh, 37 seconds to do the last 200 so um, I ran 746 the hard way uh, but even recently I, I ran the Toronto marathon attempting to to try and run 230 and there was no pack to, to run with a 2.30 pace, so I decided well, I'm in good shape relatively and um, may as well have a crack, so I went through half in, in 73.20, uh, feeling good but came completely unstuck, whereas if I'd have um, probably stuck to a, a race plan of going through in more 75, I, I would have had a good one. So. So normally I'd stick to the race plan, but um, and the times I didn't, I normally, it didn't come off. Excellent. Yeah, that's good. It's good to know for us guys that sometimes we make those mistakes. So um, sometimes you just feel like having a go and some days you pull it off, some days you don't. But every now and then I think it's good to be courageous and have a go. Yeah, but and I think uh, just on that point, I think if you're in good shape, um, your race plan has to be have, to have a go. So I think that's that's the point. Like running when I ran 27.31 for 10K, for example, I knew I was in great shape and a chance to break the Australian record, which Ron Clark had had for 31 years, which was 27.39. So... The race plan was to have a go, and, and having a go meant going out at 27, 20, 27, 30 pace, which is, which is what happened. For sure, for sure. And I'll come back and, and ask you again about that, uh, that incredible win at Zatapak in 96. Thank you. Um, so you're still the current holder uh, of the 3,000 metre civil chase national record that you set back in, in France uh, 26 years ago in 1993 in a time of 8, 16, 22. Um, which was about four four seconds than uh, than you'd ran previously, um, the year before. Um, did you feel you were in fantastic form leading into that into that uh, into that race? Yeah. So I, I, at the Zatapec in December '92, I ran um, eight twenty by myself, and that that broke Kerry O'Brien's uh, then twenty year old Australian record. So. Um, I thought by the time I got to Europe, uh, if training had gone well, I'd be able to run quicker than 8.20 and training did go well. So three days before, uh, so I got to Europe, my, uh, my first race off the plane, I ran 338 uh, for 1500 metres, which remained a lifetime PB. Uh, and then my second race off the plane was, was the, the Lille 3000 metre steeplechase and I remember warming up that morning thinking I'm in fantastic shape and I, I realistically could run about 8.15. Um, and so going back to your previous question about uh, having a race plan and, and uh, looking at do you try and win or try and uh, run a time, the goal there was to run a time but also to try and try and win the race at the same time so they went, they went hand in hand. Um, so, so yes I did line up thinking I could break the Australian record and break it by quite a bit. All right, Sean, you've represented Australia in an incredible nine consecutive World Cross Country titles from the year 1990 through to 1998. Uh, which must have also been a great ticket to some seeing some fantastic places in the world. Um, was that sort of just through your strength and speed that you developed over the years of, on the track and the road? Um, or did you do any specific training that allowed you to qualify for the World Cross over all those years? Yeah, the, it's a good question. So World Cross Country is always held the last week of March, which doesn't tie in with the, um, which for the Northern Hemisphere, which World Cross has sort of been the, the, the basis of, it's the end of their winter. So it ties in well the uh, the championship at the world championship at the end of their cross country season. For those of us in the in the southern hemisphere, it's the end of our track season. So it made it a little bit difficult because you you've got to try and uh, be strong enough to run a cross country at world cross country at the end of March, having just done the um, having done a track season. So the um, the first few world cross I did, I wasn't quite strong enough and found world cross difficult, having been doing fifteen hundred three k steeple training but towards the end of my career when I was doing more 5k 10k marathon training I could run a, a good world cross because I'd been doing that sort of strength work throughout the summer so, uh, but I guess to the the way I was training because I always did a lot of volume all year round I sh should have always been ready to do a, a good track race or a good cross country race within a few weeks of, of being called upon so uh, but cross country is a, and, and particularly world cross country uh, a terrific foundation for for all running and, and it's a shame World Cross went from being every year to every two years because I think it's it's something that it's, it's a great development um, race for distance runners uh, no matter what event you're doing and it's just a fantastic race in its, in, in its own right. Okay Sean if we can go back to Zatapet 1996 uh, Ron Clark had held the national record uh, for 30 years uh, you ran 27.31.92 that night that must have been an incredible experience. 
um, and I believe Ron Clark was there that night, but I'll get you to expand on that. Um, did you ever get to meet Ron Clark before that event or after the event? Um, or was he um, sort of sending you text messages later at night letting you know that uh, the track was measured two metres short or something like that? So can you just tell us about that incredible night? Yeah, the, the Zadapec has always been one of the, uh, the, the classic events on the Australian distance running calendar and still is. So I still remember in the, um, in the late 80s and early 90s I'd be running the, uh, the steeplechase at the Zadapec meet, the Malinowski steeplechase, and would stick around to watch my great mate Steve Monaghetti take on Andrew Lloyd and, and uh, other people, Peter Brett and, uh, and have some, Jamie Harrison have some great battles. And um, so at that stage I hadn't uh, been looking at moving up to the 10,000 metres, but even back then people were talking about will, will anyone ever get Ron Clark's national record. When I finally moved to the, um, the 10,000, I made my 10,000 metre debut at Zadapec 94 and debuted 28.02 for 10K. So that, that was probably the first sign I thought I could break the Australian 10k record. Then in 95, improved that to 27.46. Um, in May 96, I ran 27.43. Uh, got very close to Ron Clark's national record of, of 27.39. But in the 27.43, I felt like I had a lot more, lot more in me on the night. So I was a bit frustrated not to have gone, gone better. So I thought, well, I've got to be a chance to run 27.30-ish one of these days and to get the record. So uh, I was actually pleased, I, in hindsight, I didn't get the record in, um, in, in France in, in, in May 96 when I ran the 27.43 because it would have been just on some international track, not with, with, with mates and my coach and the great Ron Clark himself there. So that, that was one of the things that made um, the record, in, getting the record in 96 all the more special. Uh, a few of the guys have been training with Trent Harlow, Steve Isbell, Godfrey Nyambi from Uganda were all in the race and all ran lifetime personal best that, that night. Um, Darren Wilson, who, who ran under Ron Clark's record that night, and I have been training together very well for a few months. So well that to the point, probably six weeks out, we realised the, the, the national record was on the card. So, um, so Ron Clark and I weren't... Um, I had met Ron before through my coach Pat Lohesi and uh, Pat and Ron were, were good friends from the, the 1960s and remain good friends right through till uh, Ron's passing a few years ago. So, so Pat and Ron certainly would have been talking about the record uh, in the weeks leading in, but, but I wasn't personally, but, but Ron was commentating the race uh, live while it happened. So I um, understand with the battle lap or so to go, he uh, acknowledged it was gone. He'd been looking forward to someone breaking it, but there was, I think there was a sense of nostalgia for him when um, when it finally did happen, so uh, I was um, delighted that, that Ron was there, and I've got a got photos of, of Ron and I after the race. And in fact, there's a there's a photo of Ron Clark and myself on uh, what was Australian Runner magazine, now Runners World Australia, um, back uh, the, the January '97 edition it would have been. So uh, it's a it's a great um, memento for me to have the, have a photo with with the great man himself after the race. Yeah. And uh, no, Ron Clark wasn't texting me before or after the race because. Pre-text days, this is going back a fair while, so uh, internet had just come in and um, uh, there were mobile phones, but people hadn't figured out the text. Fantastic, yeah. Um, look, you mentioned Pat Clahessy. Um, you trained for a while at the AIS. Um, with, with Pat Clahessy accompanied by some of the best runners in the world, um, AIS was... Um, was probably at its best back then, attracting a lot of attention, a lot of, a lot of runners. Um, you guys were, were making huge strides in, in the world of running. Uh, can you tell us about that experience and the knowledge that you gained just training that incredible environment? Yeah, absolutely. I think Pat Clohersey was, is, is, you know, a lot of, um, probably the new generation don't realise just um, what a fantastic coach Pat was and, and also uh, the AIS in the, in the early 1990s, we had a terrific training group um, and we all just fed off each other's performances so Rob DeCostello of course led the way he came to the AIS in the um, in the mid 80s and when I came to Canberra in January 1990 to go to take up an AIS scholarship one of the highlights for me was to, to be able to train with uh, Rob DeCostello who even though I trained with Steve Monaghetti the previous few years in, uh, in Ballarat um, Mono was probably not quite old enough to be a to hit to be a, a, a hero of mine. Uh, Deke was he was a, Deke was ten years older than me rather than Mono being five years. So I was, uh, to be able to train with your childhood hero was incredible. Um, and then Simon Doyle at the time was he, he was ranked second in the world in 1990 and 91. So Doyle and I uh, lived together and trained together. So our group at the time at AIS. Um, 
Deke won Rotterdam in, uh, in, 2000, in 1991 in 2009. Um, in that um, same year, uh, Simon Doyle was second in the world over 1500 metres with 331. Uh, 93, I was ran 816 which ranked me top 10 in the world. Pat Carroll ran around that time, ran his 209 which ranked him in the top 15 in the world in the marathon. We just, and then there was a lot of other guys, um, Julian Painter, Dave Evans, Rod Higgins, um, Andrew Lloyd was the Commonwealth champion of course in 1990. Our trainer who was coached by Dick Telford rather than, than, than Chloe, but our training group w was just incredible and um, it's I'll be interested to see what happens with the AIS in the in the next few months, but uh, it certainly looks like it's uh, it's not going to get back to the glory days that we had in the uh, in the early 1990s, which is a real shame. We had great training group, tr great coaching, great access to sports science and medicine, great facilities. So it really was a perfect training environment, and to have lost that, having had it, I think is a, a great shame for our current generation. Certainly, certainly is. Um, how did a normal training week look like back then as far as mileage and session structure went? Yeah, so it, it varied depending on um, time of year and what event I was training for. So uh, if I was running the 3K steeple, for example, I might do uh, an hour. So I do 30 to 40 minutes every day, uh, every morning. Uh, Monday, Friday, an hour, easy hour. Uh, Wednesdays, if I was training for steeplechase, I might do 80 or 90 minutes and then Sunday, two hours to 2.20. Uh, if uh, training for steeplechase, I might do uh, a session on the track once a week of you know, maybe six by 600 metres, three of them over the barriers and, and three on the flat and try them run, run them in um, you know, 90 seconds if on the flat or not 95, 96 over the barriers. Might do another hill session, might be um, six by 500 metres hills or a, or a tempo run followed by half a dozen 30 second hills uh, and then do another session of uh, say 6 by a K normally off, off the trail, on the trails. Moving up to marathon, my long run then on a Wednesday would go out to 2 hours, uh, long run on a Sunday would go out to 2.5 to 2.40 and rather than getting on the track and running 400s or 600s I'd be doing, uh, doing longer sessions so 30 minute tempo runs or fart leak or four by five minutes, five by five minutes, something like that. So, but fairly consistent. One, one thing which was um, remained a staple throughout my career, I did a long run every week, um, but just gentle, gentle pace, three sessions every week, uh, but none of them were what I'd call a super session. So it was all about just getting fitter and fitter through doing um, consistent training week in, week out, which turned into month in, month out, and, and year in, year out, and gradually improving each year. Okay, excellent. Um, look, you've won 13, I believe, national titles over, over four distances from the Civil Chase, the 5, the 10 and the Marathon. Competed at four World Athletic Championships, four consecutive Com Games from 1990 to 2002. Racing the 3,000 metre Civil Chase in 90 and 94, uh, the 5,000 metre in 1998 and the Marathon in 2002 in Manchester. Um, Two Olympic Games, running the 5 and 10 in Atlanta and the 10,000 metres in Sydney. Um, pretty hard for us to believe that it's all been done by one athlete. Um, what do you feel were the main reasons that allowed you to compete at that high level on the biggest stages for so long? Yeah, I think, as I said, it's really consistent training over a number of, a number of years. So I just, um, I gradually improved. So take my steeplechase progression, for example. Uh, in, in 1987 I ran 919, in 1988 I ran 905, in 1989 I ran 839, in 1990 I ran 833, 1991 I ran 827, 92 I ran 820, 93 I ran 816. Um, and you know, my times at say 1500, uh, 3k, 5k would have had a similar um, progression traje trajectory and that was just through doing consistent training and, and just getting better each year from just from doing it week in, week out, year in, year out. So there was there was no special one off sessions that um, that you do to prove your fit. You, you you knew you were fit from just doing it really regularly. So I think it was just that consistency and, and following a, a, a nice sensible training that allowed me to just improve each year. So it, as much as anything, you've obviously got to have the, the underlying uh, physiology to be able to do it and, and to to reach that level. And I know my, my good mate Daniel Green, who's an exercise physiologist, he's 
his hypothesis is that one of my great abilities is that not that I've got this phenomenal natural talent that if I some like some people do if they don't train they can come out and race well my talent seems to be if you pump the training into me I'll respond to it so it's it's just having my body adapted to, to hard training over a number of years okay and uh, it's quite common for the modern runner and modern athlete today to spend more time in the gym than maybe what you guys did back in those days were you guys doing any specific strength sessions or was it just just get out and run and if you want to get stronger run longer or run more hills yeah the, the latter so we uh, simon doyle did a lot of weights uh and he was obviously one of the best in the world over 1500 meters but um uh Mona and i did maybe six or eight weeks of doing weights back in ballarat in the late 80s when we both had a a, a groin injury but um you know, not many of the guys I trained with, myself included, did many weights. It was more just doing um, doing a lot of running and get your strength through long runs and hills. That said, if if, um, if I had my time again, and it, it wasn't really around in the early early nineties, but it was by the late nineties, I would have done a lot more Pilates, and I do I do do a Pilates session once a week now. So that more that just functional strength and mix of flexibility and, and movement patterns. I think that would have that would have helped. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, now, with such a long career, there must have been some very, very high moments, but possibly some low moments. Um, can you tell us what your highest moment is and what your lowest moment would be? Oh, sure. I can't, I can't pick one out, but I'm, I'll give you a couple. So uh, there, there, there was a lot of high moments, breaking the um, Australian steeplechase record in, in uh, 1992, which had stood for over 20 years, and I'd been having a go at it for, for several years. So... That was a highlight, and then backing it up by running another four seconds faster in '93. That was a highlight. Uh, winning the World Student Games steeplechase in in '91. That was a highlight because I'd been aiming to uh, two years earlier. I hadn't even made the Australian team for the World Student Games, let alone then to to win the World Student Games two years later. Uh, in '92, I won the World Student Cross Country. That was a highlight. Having four years previously, that was my first ever team. Uh, then, of course, breaking Ron Clark's 31-year-old uh, national record over 10,000 metres, that was a highlight. Uh, and two highlights, were, uh, two additional highlights, were um, getting medals at the World Cup. So the World Cup was, um, which might be called the Continental Cup now, it was, you, you ran for your region. So we, I'd run for Oceania and you'd be up against the best from Africa, uh, North America, South America, Asia and so on. So I've got a, uh, a bronze in the steeplechase in 92 and, and second in the 5,000 in in 98 so that's a long list of highlights which i couldn't really pick one out but if i guess if i had a gun in my head and had to pick one it probably would be the 10,000 uh just because it was um the, the mix of circumstances having um a training partners and friends and coach there and and the great ron clark himself there so uh, if it was one it'd be it'd be it'd be the uh, 10,000 meter record uh, as far as low lights uh three really jump out at me. The first one was in 92, despite having been the, um, uh, the World Student Games champion the year before and um, I only just missed the 91 World Champs final. I got cut from the Olympic team at the last minute, so that was a, uh, a significant disappointment to, um, when I should have been in the, um, the, the 92 Olympic team and I was national champion and uh, won the trial, had, had the uh, qualifying time. Uh, so that was, that, that was a blow which uh, you, know, you had to fight back from and uh, my, my coach Pat Clowes, he really helped in me for refocusing and uh, getting getting on back track for that and uh, making sure I was never a borderline selection again. Uh, then fast forward to 94, um, I was uh, one of the favourites to win the steeplechase in the 94 Commonwealth Games. Uh, I'd run the Australian 3k flat record only three or four weeks before the Com Games, so I was in terrific shape but I had a, uh, a hip injury and I was my hip injury meant I couldn't get over the barriers. So the um, the first water jump, I smacked my knee into the into the um, into the barrier, and uh, by virtue of not being able to extend to get over the barrier, ran what was by a long way my slowest ever international steeplechase. So that was one of one of the only times I ever crossed the line and burst into tears, just in in part disappointment, part frustration, because I knew it was a, a, a real missed missed opportunity. And I never ran a steeplechase again, so luckily I could run on the flat because if, uh, if I was only a steeplechaser that might have been uh, all over Red Rover for, for a competitive running career. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, I had, as I said, one of my best ever runs was the, the World Cup 5000 metres in 98 where I got second to Daniel Coleman and ahead of Dieter Bauman who had been the Olympic champion a few years earlier. 
the Commonwealth Games were a week later in, in Kuala Lumpur. Flew to Kuala Lumpur, um, got off the plane, did a few strides, and I noticed my calf was a little bit tight doing, doing some strides. Uh, ran the heats in the um, well, semi-final of the, of the Common Games 5000 uh, in, in Kuala Lumpur was, was feeling fantastic and tore my calf 100 metres from the finish so I ma managed to get across the line um, and qualified for the final and would have been um, on form, a good chance to get second to Komen in the, in the final or certainly get on the podium uh, but couldn't start the final due to a torn calf. So, those three were, it's probably just the, the Olympics just missing out and uh, thinking, well, I may never be an Olympian, and that's what you know, a lot of people aspire to. And 94 and 98, Commonwealth being a genuine chance to a met, to get a medal and being in great shape and having that sort of taken from you just at the last minute. So, uh, all disappointing, but you've got to, life's full of ups and downs, you've just got to enjoy the good times and bounce back from the, from the disappointments. Sure, sure. And... Uh... Obviously, you've had a very successful length of the career, but it's still going. And um, last year, you uh, you took out the Perth Marathon in a time of uh, two hours and thirty two minutes. Um, top ten at six foot track, which I, I believe you have been trying to crack the top ten for for a while there. Yeah, so right. so still moving, still moving incredibly well. Um, now. You've obviously just recently entered into the over 50s category, and I know there's another record that you're sort of hunting down, which is the, uh, the Australian over 50 marathon record, which sits at uh, 2 hours and 30 minutes and 52 seconds, which was ran back in Melbourne in, in 1987. Um, I think you've had a couple of cracks at that, um, and you recently mentioned um, over in, in Chicago, was it? Where you uh, went Toronto, over? Yeah. Toronto, yeah. okay. So um, that's obviously still an aim of yours to, to break that. Uh, that Australian record for the marathon, and when do you um, when do you think you might have another crack at doing that? Yeah, sure. So uh, I got I had a break when I was in my late thirties. So I um, I was um, where I just um, worked too hard and uh, drank too much wine and beer and ate too much chocolate and got fat and um, and then decided okay time to uh, time to start running again. And when when my wife could beat me pushing the pram, I was like okay, it's time to look in the mirror and when I looked in the mirror the double chin appeared I was like okay time to get rid of the double chin and start running again so I didn't actually um, aspire to get back and, and run um, in competitive races again my my goal was actually just to improve my time over the Canberra Times Fun Run each year um, and it, it pushed out to 40.08 when I was about 46 I think and so I just gradually brought that down about a minute a year uh, but then I got to the point where I got to 35 minutes and I tried to, um, I needed something, uh, a stronger focus which would make me train harder and that's where six foot, cap, six, six foot track came into the equation. Um, but then getting to, to your point, turning 52 years ago, I, was, I had a look at um, what the Australian um, Masters Marathon record was and I saw it was a, a fine 2.30.50 and I then had a look at what the 3K, 5K and 10K were. Uh, so at all, I reckon I can pro probably a better chance of getting the track time. So I did. I got the I got the three. I ran um, eight fifty eight, fifteen thirty four, and thirty two nineteen to take the um, three five and ten records. The marathon, as I said, was probably the toughest out of the four. The two thirty is uh, is fine running. So I did have a crack at it in in Perth um, and ran two thirty two twelve. Um, and I think uh, I won that race by um, by about two or three minutes. So I think if that was a race that was run at 2.30 pace, I was probably in good enough form to get it, but I was certainly happy to have the win. In Toronto then, I was actually in far better shape than in, um, than in Perth. I uh, had up, up the training more, my, um, my speed was good, my, I'd been doing really good long runs, and I thought 2.30 would be almost a formality. And I think it's the, um, you can sometimes, if things are going super well, you can almost, get lulled into a full sense of security. So that was, and going back to one of your earlier questions, my plan was to run at 229, 230 pace, uh, but I was feeling so good early, I decided to run with the 226 pace, and that's when the, the wheels came off at uh, 26K, having been on 226 pace, and I uh, blew up and ran 246. Uh, I think I'm now back in pretty good shape and, and uh, running the marathon in um, in Christchurch in, uh, on the 2nd of, 2nd of June, so I think uh, all going well, I'd be a good chance to run 229, 230. But really, if I, if, if I don't do that, uh, I probably won't have another crack at it. I'll pro I'm, I coach Emily Brickercheck now and enjoy doing um, her um, 
training with her. She's got bigger fish to fry than my goal. She's aiming to make the Olympic team for Tokyo next year. So if, uh, if things don't go well at Christchurch, I'll probably still just be doing um, EMS training over the track season next year. So um, uh, it'd be, uh, be, be 12 months before I do another marathon, I'd say. But uh, it's more that um, just the process I'm enjoying getting out there and uh, having some setting, having fun setting goals and having a crack at them, irrespective whether they're a, uh, just a a personal old man goal or a uh, or, or a current Australian record. Okay, excellent, fantastic, Sean. Look, it's been incredible talking to you today, mate. Um, the information you've given <laughs> myself and the viewers is just fantastic. Um, just so my viewers have got more more to sort of take away as far as to, to implement into their own training um, and what surrounds their, their training. Is there any sort of advice or words of wisdom that you could actually give them um, in order for them, for them to sort of stay healthier and, and improve as a runner? Yeah, sure. I, I think the big thing is to, well, ideally get a coach who knows what they're doing and, um, and get a, a good sound program. The other thing is to be realistic with your program. A lot of people uh, try and do too much and break down or do too little and never reach their potential. So it's a, you've got to try and figure out, get that sweet spot that's enough that you can reach your potential but not so much that you that you break down uh, and and for me I see it, we're in a world these days where you've there are the social media and apps like Strava which are terrific online training diaries but the risk is that uh, everyone tries to to do a, a really good training session which might be at the expense of, of your race performances so I always um, try to hold a little bit back in training so that you've got come race day you've uh, you can, uh, if you need to go to the well, there's some water there, and you can um, you can really dig deep. But um, the a lot of people these days I see a uh, are training really really hard, and it's almost too hard sometimes at the risk of um, risk of overtraining or getting injured. So I think for me the the path to to long term success is building up over over a number of years to a point where you can handle a uh, a decent training load going regularly as i said week in week out doing doing super sessions you might get some short-term fitness and it might get you there but it's also a, a high risk strategy so i'd always adopt the um, slow and steady wins the race by just gradually building up your training program over a period of time excellent no that's fantastic sean i totally agree with all that and hopefully everyone takes that in as well yeah. um like i said everyone sometimes leaves their, their best sessions on the track as they say and uh, being able to find that extra edge or lift on race day is, um, is, is always where the art lies. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, it's, it's great being here. It's been fantastic, Sean, and uh, best of luck for the future. Thank you. And I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, so 2.30, if I can run 2.30 in Chicago, uh, Chicago in, uh, in Christchurch, I'll be, I'll be delighted. And then uh, I'll uh, probably try and run a, a few... Uh, over 50 track PBs over the summer, but uh, as I said, the important thing really is just what setting your own goals at your own level. I'm just lucky that um, the goals I'm setting happen to be the Australian age records, but if they weren't, I'd be still just setting goals that um, that personally meant something to me. So that's, I think that's what it's all about, enjoying your running and, and setting goals that are realistic and achievable. Excellent. Sound advice, Sean. Thank you very much, Sean. Right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. That's an incredible story of a remarkable athlete, incredible man, John Crichton. To be able to race at such a high level over all those distances, unbelievable. Like really, really hard to, to imagine that. Um, but yeah, so I hope you guys really enjoyed that. Uh, Sean has also agreed to um, do a personalised autograph of a piece of clothing uh, to, to a subscriber of, of, of my channel. So if you haven't subscribed, do that now. Make sure your profile is public, otherwise I won't actually know who you are. Um, so yeah, just uh, YouTube, you normally default your subscription to private, so you have to go public there. And um, or otherwise, just do a comment underneath the video below, and again, that will that will run you through the process of, of setting you up a public profile, just so you can be in, in the hat to uh, to win that piece of clothing, which would be a fantastic little treasure to have. Uh, unfortunately, I won't put my name in there, but I would love to have that myself. Um, so yeah, I hope you really enjoyed that. I've got some other uh, interviews coming up, so um, yeah, so subscribe, and you'll be the first one to see them. Thanks. Bye.